Hello everybody, this is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited tonight because we have a debut local author in the house, which is always a very, very special thing. So tonight we are celebrating Christina Lee's Clue to the Universe, which is, oh yay! I was about to say Vanna White moments, which is an awesome new tale about loss that two characters have one in which her father unexpectedly passes and one in which the father has walked out and their friendship as well as love for building rockets well model rockets but still absolutely amazing and awesome and how they come together and are able to help each other work through things um so it's a really beautiful tale of loss and friendship and just chef's kiss to it and she is going to be in conversation with Erin Entrada Kelly. And she is an award-winning author who has a couple books under her belt and has been awarded the Newbery Medal for Hello. Sorry, I did not want to tongue-tie when I said that. <laughs> as well as other books you may know from her are We Dream of Space, as well as Lalani of the Distant Sea. Now, before I pass it off to Erin, just a little, my Vanna White section now. As you guys, many of you have seen, we have our lovely comment section where you can share all of your love for the amazing authors that we have. And since this is an event, one of the best parts of events is that you get to ask questions. You have our authors at your mercy. So <laughs> if you have any questions, make sure that you ask them down below, right where it says, ask a question. Click that button and that's where you can submit your questions. Also too, since we've got lots of you, make sure that you vote for the questions you'd like answered and it will bump them up. So if there's a question where you're like, oh my goodness, it is imperative to life that this is answered, <laughs> make sure that you vote that one up. And then my last little thing is that the best way to support a debut book is to go out and purchase it. So if you would like, we have actual signed copies, which is like a unicorn these days. So if you would like a physically signed copy of Clues to the Universe, there's a buy book button down below. And I'm going to go now and pass it off to Erin, and I will see you guys at the end of the event. Thank you so much, Christina. I am so excited and I'm honored to be uh, moderating this conversation with you for your amazing, amazing book. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I, it's such an honor to be here speaking with you as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I, I'm honored to have uh, my book comp to your book. I'm always, I'm yeah. always sure when my book is comped. I, I'm like, oh, okay. I read that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we're here to talk about clues to the universe. And what I want to do really quickly is mm -hmm. I feel like I want to, I mean, we got a little brief summary, but I'm going to read the, the back, the back copy a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because when I try to summarize books, it, it turns into a nightmare and we'll be here for the full hour. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is clues to the universe. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it already, but if you're not, this is, this is, this is the deal. On the surface, Rosalind Garrity and Benjamin Burns are completely different. Roe wants to be a rocket scientist, but she's reeling from her dad's unexpected death. Benji loves drawing and is convinced his dad created his favorite comic, Spacebound, but has no way to reach him since he walked out on the family. Though Roe and Benji were only supposed to be partners on a science project, they become unlikely friends. Unlikely friendships make for the best stories, right? Together, they take on two seemingly impossible tasks, finishing Roe's model rocket and tracking down Benji's father. As they face bullying, grief, and their own differences, Benji and Ro try to piece together clues to some of the biggest questions in the universe. And one of the things that I loved about your book, um, as a reader and as a writer, I'm, I'm very driven by characters. You know, that's what I always say, you know, readers will follow good characters anywhere. Um, but if you have a, a, an uneven plot with, with unlikable characters or characters that people can't relate to, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, amazing your plot is you have to have characters serving as the emotional mm -hmm. engine of any story right and i feel like yeah absolutely your characters from the first page until the last page feel so three-dimensional like they, they like they're just walking off the page and i'm curious you know how do you have a process of de did or did you have a process for them specifically for developing them or what and what did that look like yeah, absolutely. I think 
Clues the Universe was special to me in that it was one of my very first character-driven novels. I think when I started writing, um, I was completely plot-driven. Like, I would always have an idea of like, oh, like these three things happen, like or like this happens after that. But it would just end up being really dry and just kind of, you know, you weren't sure where the story was going or like why it was being written. Um, but yeah, like the characters just came to me like really vividly. Um, I think I thought I always wanted to write, I, I knew I was I wanted to write a book about an artist and a scientist. I just didn't know how, I didn't know what format. And I thought of the character of Roe at first. Um, and the image that kind of first came to my mind was this girl trying to logically and scientifically piece together the aftermath of her father's car crash. Um, and that was just the first like vivid image that struck in my mind. And I, I knew I had to kind of find out more about her. And then her voice came really clearly to me. And then, and then Benji's voice came after and it was kind of this really kind of sarcastic, funny foil, foil to Rose. And so the way that I develop characters is I try to think about kind of what they want the most, um, and kind of what stands in their way. Um, and so with Rose, she, the thing that she wants the most is that she's really trying to heal from her grief. Um, she's trying to, you know, piece together everything after her father's death. But she's always someone who's used to having a really logical plan about everything. So she's like, OK, like I'm going to do this and that and that. And then I'm going to like feel better um, because that's kind of what's worked for me in the past. And grief is something that isn't really logical or linear to deal with. And so she's trying to use like this really kind of scientific method to piece together something that isn't quite able to fit in that. Um, and so the entire novel is just her kind of using all these things that she's tried. So like putting, you know, trying to rebuild the model rocket that she and her dad worked on or, or trying to really logically find Benji's father across the country. Um, and it, internally, she's just trying to heal from grief. And Benji, on the other hand, um, he was a character that I loved so much. He, his voice, I mean, his voice came later to me, but it came super strongly. Like, I wasn't sure I was able to kind of write a guy, because I'd never written from the POV of a guy character before. And his voice, like, I just heard his jokes. And I was like, well, I, I guess this is what I have to do now. Um, <laughs> but his, the thing that he wants the most is that he just kind of wants his own father back like he is always is someone who always escapes into reality his current situation isn't really great he has some kind of family issues you know his dad kind of left the family and he's dealing with this childhood bully and so his way of coping with things is to kind of always escape real reality essentially like he envisions himself going on these adventures through comic books and just really kind of uses them is something that it, you know he like really relies on to kind of cope with his current reality, um, and so he's someone who is just super you know dreamy and non-confrontational, and he has this big lofty goal of like oh I keep imagining you know finding my father someday like kind of this big epic mission to find out who my father really is. Um, yeah, but he's also really scared of kind of the the typical things in life, like standing up to bullies or or seventh grade is like this really terrifying, frightening thing because his friend just moved away. Um, so he's someone who really, really deeply wants his father back, but he's always really scared of kind of confronting the the present. And so Ro and Benji kind of really parallel each other and really kind of bounce off each other in that way. And that Ro ha brings the super like driven mentality, and she's like, I have a plan, and and Benji's. Um, kind of brings this sort of support and camaraderie to Roe as she heals from grief. So, yeah. Yes. And you know what? It, it makes me think about why books are so important for kids at this age, because you talked about yeah. navigating grief and trying to apply logic to difficult situations, which I think we've all been trying yeah. to do um, at any point in our lives, but it feels especially relevant today in kind of unique ways is just trying to figure out what's happening and why. And sometimes there's not logic to um, grief or logic to death or logic to bad things happening to good people. And exactly, yeah. books like this help young people navigate. If they haven't experienced grief yet, you know, they will someday. Unfortunately, that's going to happen. And yeah. books like yours kind of help them navigate those things in a safe way bubble, right? You know, where they can experience right. someone else going through something and seeing how those characters handled it. And then they exactly. can take that into their lives. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I try making grief pretty like really kind of detailed and personable in the book. And so I I tried thinking of the ways that I miss the people in my life, like not necessarily, I mean, the ways that I've dealt with grief, but also the ways that I've dealt with people who, you know, friends who leave me for like a couple months, you know, like during college or something. Um, and I tried thinking of these details kind of like, what do I miss most about those people? Like if I see, you know, um, like item that reminds me of them, like I miss them a lot. Just like little common details or like if I hear a song like, that sends me straight to my feels. Like I just really, really deeply, you know, feel like emotional in that moment because I miss them so much. And these are things that remind me of um, exactly why I miss them. And so I tried to include it in kind of smaller details that even if kids, you know, haven't necessarily gone through that stage of grief in their life, it, it's still something to, to relate to. Um, yeah, so I, I tried, I, I think I tried to include it in like the, the smaller minutia. Yes, and you know what the th the thing is too that that even if you haven't experienced grief or all yes. the different things that happens and happen in the books that we read, there there is such universality to knowing what it feels like to be lonely, to want something that you don't yeah. have anymore, to want to be able to stand up to someone, to do all these things. There's there's so many ways in right because a lot of these yeah. things are universal. It doesn't have to be exactly the same trajectory of your life right but, but exactly people, readers just connect to all these different really special things you know and that's yeah. what books do for people exactly yeah and also kind of the universality of like making a friend um i i think platonic friendships are, are ever like they're incredible you know like you can fall in love but you can also fall in friend as well like the feeling of finding your best friend is the best feeling in the entire world and so kind of that that small moment where like they they're like are, are we like, are we friends? Like, are we actually doing this? Is was one of my favorite things to write in the book. I well. love that fallen friend. I love that. Now, one thing I want to talk about too, that I think is really interesting about your book and about you is, so you study economics yeah. and you're a writer. And as you know, there's always the, the stereotype of uh, good with words, bad with numbers or right brain, left brain, and all these kinds of things that we believe about creative people like you can't be both creative mm -hmm. and good at math or whatever it may be right, right? so i wanted yeah. you to speak to that a little bit and and how do you feel when people say oh i'm an english person not a math does it bother you or does is that something you thought about whenever you were approaching the book at all it doesn't bother me that much just because I, when i was growing up i always thought of myself as a very right brain person and i will say as an e like i'm also bad at math like <laughs> very much <laughs> just have to be transparent about that um but i i think i i mean one of the things that kind of like stuck in my mind very early on was i i once attended this author event um and i think the author was like a science professor or something in her previous uh you know in a previous life but um she she was talking about how science and art are the same and that they both draw patterns out of chaos um and that's that was just such a beautiful statement that like stuck with me for years and years and years and i think that really kind of came to fruition in this book um in which kind of there are these like really beautiful parallels between science and art and um i mean it it doesn't bother me at all because i i also used to think like oh if i'm like artistic i i can't i simply cannot do science um I, although i will also i was not the best at high school science as well um but i i do think that there is definitely room to kind of draw these sort of parallels between art and science and i think that's also like a bigger metaphor i think for like you know being friends with someone who's completely different from you or or kind of finding commonalities and, and things that seem very kind of not very similar from the outset so yeah that's kind of how i go about it at least because you know what i mean the, when you're saying that it made me think that it, it's all ideas you know art is all about ideas economics yeah. is all about ideas science is about ideas i mean yeah, you know exactly. that's what it really boils down to you know and, yeah yeah and i love that they that the two of them are so different but like you said they find this this common ground and, and it, it yeah. kind of speaks to how um you know the people in our lives can inform us about ourselves and vice versa and that, yeah. that really absolutely happens here because we all ha have these preconceived um ideas of what something is right and then sometimes exactly. it's another person in our lives to come in and 
show us a different way or, or show us a different path or take us on a new path with them. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, Not just too. unexpected kind of dis discoveries. Yes, yes. So we have a lot of questions coming in. So if you have questions, I want to remind everyone to put them down there. Um, all right. Oh, there's so many questions. And I know when I do these events, Christina, I always love the questions. So I'm going to jump in with some questions because let's see where it takes us. OK, so, oh, before I, before I ask you, though, this is a question that, that I love to ask all authors. Mm -hmm. And it can be difficult to answer without uh, being spoilery, but sure. hopefully you can. I'm curious in clues to the universe. There's so there's so many wonderful scenes in this book. But do you have a favorite scene? Do you have a favorite moment? And can you share it with us without spoiling anything? Yeah, absolutely. I do. Um, so there's a scene. I mean, okay, I, I love like eating. Um, I love like Chinese pastries. Um, and they're like very near and dear to my heart. And also one thing I love so much about clues is I was able to like inject all these like cultural, you know details in the book because Ro, Ro is Chinese American. Her mom is Chinese, like she, she has a very strong like Chinese American connection and family in the Bay Area. Um, and so she's very in tune with kind of the Chinese side of the family. And there's a scene with um, all of the Chinese pastries that I loved as a kid. Um, and it's a scene that's very, very near to, in, it's, it's not just them eating pastries, although that would have been a fantastic scene on its own, but um, it's, it's also, it, it, it was a moment that a lot of things culminated in. And so they're kind of, you know, at this like really tender moment, like with, featuring pastries, but also um, kind of really grappling with a lot of their like shared feelings. And, and it's a moment that they get to connect with each other a little bit deeper. As well. And so, um, yeah, I, I hope that didn't spoil too much. I try to be vague, um, but I, it, it's, yeah, I, I, it was a scene that I loved writing and I, I wrote it and I was like, I think that was the first scene I wrote in which I was like, this could become a real book because I, I, I love this scene and I want the scene out in the world. Oh, so did you write it? Non chronologically, did you write it non linearly? I I I wrote it linearly, but I was doubting myself pretty hard up until that point. It was the first middle grade. I mean, always always imposter syndrome, but also it was the very first middle oh, yeah. grade book I've written. Um, and so the entire time I was like, I don't know if I'm capable of like writing this book. Like, I don't know if I can be funny. Like, I don't know if I can like do these things, you know. And so <laughs> I was like doubting myself this whole time and then I wrote that scene and I was like oh like this is something that I can definitely get behind like <laughs> this, oh, I this love is that. yes yeah exactly you have that moment. yes I love that yeah. and now here's a question that that I was curious about as well from from one of our viewers thank you viewers is was Ro inspired by a real person in your life is Ro is Ro Christina or is Ro yeah. who is Ro I would love to be real, honestly. She has a life together. Um, so Ro has a couple of inspirations. Um, one of the biggest inspirations was, I mean, this book is, this is a book about like childhood best friends. Um, and so uh, Ro, parts of Ro are based on my childhood best friend, whom the book is also dedicated to. Um, and also uh, the character of Ro is also based on, so the, name Ro came from Rosalind um, and I named her after uh, the scientist named Rosalind Franklin, um, the woman who took the pictures that identified the DNA structure of the double helix structure and then her male colleagues took the pictures without her permission and then used it and then got the Nobel Prize. And so I, I always wanted to kind of use the book to honor sort of female scientists as well and to kind of um, you know, kind of dedicate it to like female scientists and, and also scientists from marginalized, marginalized identities who don't get the acknowledgement and acclaim that they absolutely deserved in history. And so that's kind of, that, that was the significance behind the name Roe as well. But yeah, Roe is definitely very left brain as a character and, and that is that is not me. So I, I aspirationally would love to be this character, but um, alas, I'm not. A lot of our time, a lot of times our characters are aspirational, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, so one thing that that made me think of is, you know, I feel like there have there have been an influx or an increase of books with 
with space themes, science themes. Yeah. I mean, I wrote one. You, there's so many exactly. out now, right? Which is amazing. Right. So I'm curious, what is it, um, maybe for you and for Roe, or in just in general, mm -hmm. what do you think it is about space and the beyond that that just in, she has enchanted people for since forever yeah. and continues to enchant them? What what is it? Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, before I start, I would love to plug your book, We Dream of Space. Everyone buy it. It's so good. <laughs> I wanted to insert that plug in somewhere. And I, I remember reading it and I was, I, I mean, I was just like absolutely dazzled by it. It was, it was so good. And, and yeah, I mean, I was thinking about it all this time, right? And I, I was talking about it with my dad the other day. And, and I think uh, he mentioned sort of, or I, I, I think this is a conversation that happened a while ago in which he mentioned that, you know, when I was a kid, like I love, I was, I was super fascinated by space. You know, I would put together my own telescope and this kit that like my parents bought me and try to like look at the stars and just like, like God had this like big space phase. And then my dad had that as well. And like his dad, and it's just like you said, like very, I, I mean, it's timeless. Everyone's just kind of fascinated by what's beyond. And yeah, I mean, I, I've, you know, there's books out there like your book and also I think See You in the Cosmos and um, oh. Stars Are Made Of, just so many books that ca kind of capture the like magic and wonder of space. And I think it's, I mean, just, there, there is this kind of timeless but also this like endless wonder about space like it's always out there and out of reach and I think that that's also kind of such a parallel for like growing up as well um like you're you're dealing with these things that seem really big and unattainable and unreachable and with these kind of small things that seem super super lofty I mean um and I think exploring space is also a really great way to kind of like metaphorically explore the process of growing up as well. Kind of, you know, it, it sort of represents like having like these really big dreams that you hope to attain someday, but um, not knowing quite how to yet. But like you would, you would like to get there eventually. Oh, I love that parallel. That really makes yeah. sense. I really love that. And See You in the Cosmos is one of my favorite books. Now, we're not going to get off on too much of a tangent about See You in the Cosmos. It's a great book. But I have to tell a quick story. I was reading that book on a plane. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Alex, the character has his rocket and I start getting this real sense of foreboding, which is what happens whenever you just fall in love with characters like I did with your book or just anytime you're just with a, a strong character and you just are right. feeling for them. And I right. had this moment where I thought, I don't know if, if his rocket is going to make it. Right. And I turned yeah. to the man next to me who was this just this big burly man who I did not know. Yeah. And I looked at him because I needed to talk to someone. And I said, I don't right. know if the rocket is going to make it. I just said, <laughs> you know, and he's like, uh, like, you know, okay. He didn't say yeah. anything. What is he going to say? He doesn't know what yeah. I'm talking about. But anyway, yeah. I just had to tell someone. That's what happens. That's how he felt about your book, except I, I had no one to talk to about your book because I was reading it. I was like, I mean, I knew it was, I knew what happened because, yeah, yeah, but um, I was like, oh my, I just want these people to be okay. But I was also reading it alone in my bed at like 2 a.m. And so like, I had no one to like comfort me. <laughs> so I like suffered heartbreak with these characters. And so, yeah, I, I definitely know what you mean. <laughs> it's such a great feeling when, when you finish a book and you just want to talk to someone about it, you know? Exactly. Well, I'm glad we're talking here. So um, here's a great question. And of course, you can't tell us you can't tell us uh, the ending because that would be very spoiler. But one question that came through is, was there an alternate ending or did you always did you already know you wanted it to end that way? That's a great question. Yeah, um, that's such a fantastic question. Yeah. And also, I always struggle with endings as a writer because I, I mean, I always know how to begin books. I don't really know where they go. Um, I, I did. So. I did have a minor alteration or um, like changed ending, I think, when I first drafted the book, just because it was so rough. And I didn't really know where it's going in the first draft. It was like extremely exploratory. Um, but then, I mean, the ending, I think I, I slowly began, like I slowly started thinking about it. And I was like, ah, this is the ending that makes sense and like thematically ties everything together. And so I was very happy to have arrived at the, new and improved ending and so yes but it didn't nothing dramatically changed in terms of where the characters were going to end up i think it was just the i think the last scene or so that like got a little bit tweaked but i i hoped resonated a little bit more than the first draft would 
endings are so hard, right? I, I'm not good at them either. They always get revised because I feel like to me, it, um, especially when you're writing realistic fiction, it, mm -hmm. it's hard to end because life doesn't happen like a Brady Bunch episode, right? Where right. it's like, oh, it's the end of the half hour and right. let's play the music. And and, yeah, yeah, right. So you just kind of think, okay, how am I going to end this book? in a way that the reader feels like they'll be fine, but right. it doesn't feel like, you know, it's the end of a Brady Bunch episode and everyone's going to go to the next half hour. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm someone that I, I don't like, I'm not a very good plotter. And so I always just go all over the place with my ending. Like I, I struggle with them emotionally, but also like, where are they going to be? You know? And so that's, that's where revision kicks in. That's where kind of the <laughs> rewriting everything kicks in. And you're like, ah, this is the one that will hurt them, but not hurt them too badly. <laughs> yes, exactly. I struggle with plotting as well because you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about things like, oh, three act structure and you need yeah. to have an exciting incident, 20%. The cat needs to be up. saved. Yes. And I'm just like, I don't know what anyone's talking about because that's not how I write books. And right. I, I do everything through my characters. And I feel like yeah. when I read your book, it felt like that too. Like my characters inform where the story goes. My characters yeah. inform the plot you know, it's everything is channeled through them. Exactly. Is that, is exactly. that how kind of you thought of when you were writing this book? Is that how you approached it as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I used to be kind of this serial, like, oh, I have to fill out that like save the cat beat sheet and like hit every yeah. single point. And then I think over the years, it just became maybe slightly more intuitive to me. Like I was like, I, you know, there has to be a beginning and ending a climax hopefully a midpoint, like all these essentials, but the characters for me also, I completely agree. They absolutely dictated the story. They dictated the climax, they dictated the midpoint. Like it was all about, you know, how they like were feeling and, and what happened in their own personal journeys. And so, yeah, it also like a thought of clues is an incredibly character driven book. Yeah. I feel like those beat sheets, I tried to do one once and I just don't understand them. And all yeah. right, different of course right all writers have a different process and yeah I, thought, I wrote a fantasy it was my first fantasy and I thought okay I'm gonna try to use the beat sheet now or the three-act structure because I'm writing this plot and it still wound up being very character driven like character -driven. I can't get away from characters leading me you know but all, of course all writers are different and I have a different process yeah. but I love to hear from other writers who who feel like plot is not is not necessarily what's motivating the story. It's the character. Right. That's how I operate as well. Yeah. So it's too, valid. Apparently. Our authors say that that's how they, you know, roll, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Here's a question. Uh, because both of you use alternating point POVs in your works. I'd mm -hmm. love to know how you approach that. I love that yeah. question. So what about you? How do you, how do you approach it? Yeah. Um, for, for clues, I think I the characters came, uh, like I mentioned, like very strongly to me. And so I, I kind of knew, you know, what they're about and their voices. But I I loved kind of like hearing their voice and hearing how they thought about things. And so for the dual POV, I mean, it was the first dual POV book I'd ever written. I'd only ever written like single POV. And I kind of really wanted to like think of the small details again kind of like going back to like the the minutia like for Ro I I I mean other than kind of her interest in science and everything I I had her always think of things in like very logical manners so she would always like quantify things like she would never exaggerate she would say things exactly as they were even with her emotions she was like I, I had this thing where like Ro wouldn't really know how to vocalize her emotions. She would just like, she would just be like, oh, I'm like feeling like this kind of feeling. I don't really know how to explain it. And that's just her kind of, you know, feeling with her emotions. Whereas Benji is all over the place. He was like, oh my God, like today was horrible. Like I had a million billion things to do. Like just had this exaggerated flair to him. He always would like narrate things. Like he would have like narrate scenes in his head. Like they were a comic book. 
um, he would always exaggerate things like far and wide. And I think that was uh, my way of kind of writing him. And also like, just again, like smaller details, like what they liked, what food they liked, their interests, the way that they bantered with each other. Um, yeah, I, I tried to, I, I, I know that like my characters or dual POV was definitely something I wanted to work on. So I really wanted to make sure that I kept the voices distinct. But yeah, so I definitely rely, relied on a few kind of like tools to help me do that, namely with the voice and like the characteristics and, and just kind of their, their, their like little mannerisms, I guess. I love that. And, and that's yeah. similar to me too, because I spend so much time with my characters in my head that I right. feel like I know them. I feel like they're not even characters that I invented anymore, but, but they're just right. kind of something else, you know, and right, I feel exactly. like you spend so much time writing them in your head, they become, mm -hmm. they just become three dimensional. Right. And I do the same thing you mentioned earlier, where I always ask what, what does my character want most in life? Yeah. And what are they afraid of? And how can right. I put the things that they're afraid of between them and the thing that they want? And yeah. often, especially in middle grade literature, the thing that they want isn't really the thing that they want or the thing. Yes. That they want, right. Absolutely. They, yes. They want one thing, but really it's something else that they want. And usually it's the something else that they get. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I, I can yeah, I was thinking this with like this. I, I'm so glad we think the same because this is exactly how I wrote my book. Like, I my characters obviously wanted something from the outset, right? Like they wanted you know these like concrete things, but deep down, I mean, Benji just wanted to be brave, and Ro just wanted to heal. And so, like, I I didn't reveal that at the outset, but I think throughout the book, I hope it became apparent, you know, through my characters and their journeys that that you know this is what they achieved at the ending. Yeah. Yes. And I think that that's one of the that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have as it we're adults, you know, mm -hmm. writing middle grade, writing for children and writing as children with with you right. know, middle, middle grade characters, obviously age characters. Um, but we have the perspective of mm -hmm. all our failings, all our triumphs, yeah. all our things. <laughs> that we know that sometimes the thing that you want isn't the thing that you get. And it, sometimes it's not even the thing you really want. We know that as adults, because we've lived through all our ups and downs and all our pains right. and, sorrows and joys. Right. And we use that as an emotional resource to inform mm -hmm. how we write our characters. That's what I do. And it sounds like that's what you yeah. do, right? You know, we use that yeah. knowledge to infuse it in there so that right. people who were at that time, that at that age and struggling like we were, because it sounds like, you were a, a fearful, quiet child, as I was, I was. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. those kids out there who are like little Aaron's and Christina's have books <laughs> that can like help them. First exactly. of all, know that they're not alone. That's that's always the most important thing to me. Like, yeah, if you read one of my books and you feel like you have a friend, even just during that time, like you feel seen, mm -hmm. in whatever way you feel seen um then mission accomplished you know and yeah. hopefully hopefully it travels with you after you're done with the book but right. if, you, if it happens while you're reading the book then mission accomplished right yeah. and that's kind of a good segue into the next question which is speaking of taking books with us right right <laughs> um, we have a question i love heartwarming middle grade me too uh, <laughs> and i love reading it um and loved reading it during middle school do you have any heartwarming middle grade favorites you read when you were younger? Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I grew up on like Rebecca Stead books. Um, I actually, yeah, oh my God. Um, I'm emotional. Um, I, yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I grew up on, I actually read her YA first, I think, because I was like the like, 10 year old child who's like read books that were not in my age range. Um, and so I read First Light first, her debut novel. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I loved it. And then I read her middle grade and I was just, I was ruined. I was in the back of the bus, just like crying. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and I just, it was a book that I like, I, like, I think When You Reach Me was a book that I carried with me, like you said, like for a long time. And those characters just stuck with me for a while. And Goodbye Stranger. I mean, just, 
she kept coming out, like she kept knocking it out of the park. Um, and so those are kind of the books that I grew up on in middle school, just because I had this fantastic librarian actually. Um, and I, I didn't realize how lucky I was with my librarian until I, um, you know, she, she would buy every single book that like someone requested. Like if you wanted this book, she would buy it for you. She would like recommend it for you. She'd run all these PowerPoint presentations. And so that was how I heard about Rebecca Stead's books. Um, just cause she had like always had this like roundup of books. And then I fell in love with that. And that was just such a, such a blueprint for me writing middle grade as well. Cause I was like, I want to make people feel the way that Rebecca said made me feel on the back of the bus at seventh grade. So that's um, amazing. I, yeah. yeah. She is amazing. So, um, I love, I love Rebecca said as well. And when you reach me is one of my favorite books. I think it's one of the most perfect middle grade novels ever, ever written. Yeah. I'm too old to have grown up with her books in middle school, but whenever I started writing, um, middle grade, and decided to kind of take my career in that direction. She was definitely one of the mm -hmm. authors that I read. And right. it, uh, that book is amazing. But yeah. I grew up with uh, Judy Bloom. Judy Bloom um, yeah. was and is my hero. Um, and I, and you know, when, when I was growing up, when I was a kid in the eighties, middle grade wasn't even really a category. It wasn't really a thing that existed, mm -hmm. you know? So you yeah. kind of just went from Judy Bloom to Stephen King. Right. <laughs> Judy Bloom to V.C. Andrews. And there's nothing in between at that time. And Judy Bloom um, is definitely my greatest influence. I wrote a lot of Judy Bloom knockoffs. Did you write when you were when you were that age, when you were in middle school? Have you been writing for that long? Or Yeah, I've been writing since I was in middle school. Yep. So would yep. you write Rebecca Stead knockoffs of your own or? I wouldn't. So I, when I was a kid, I like read a lot of fantasy as well as Rebecca said. And so I'd always write these like really awful fantasies. Like <laughs> it just, I, you know, I just had that phase. Um, and, and then when like the dystopian era came, I write really bad dystopian books. Like I went through it all. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I also did as you did, like, I would always try to imitate my favorite authors, but also that's, that's a great way to learn how to write as well because Absolutely. I think yeah over time you begin to develop your own voice and then eventually I think it you like absorb it through like osmosis or something and then when it comes time like you're able to to have kind of that like background knowledge and be able to write that book but yes I I similar to you I also wrote a lot of <laughs> like knockoffs of my favorite authors in middle school absolutely and you know I I teach uh, an MFA program at Rosemont College and last semester one of their one of my students' assignments was every week they had to emulate a different writing style of a different author. So yeah. it might be like, okay, now you have to write like George Saunders, and now you have to write like Stephen King, and and it's all about just trying new things. But also, mm -hmm. when you try new things, that's how you also find your way, right? You, you're, exactly. You're emulating your favorite authors, and you're also finding your own voice. Exactly. So yeah. I think a lot of us who started writing young definitely did that. A lot of copying. We'll yeah. say inspired, we'll say fan fiction or inspired fiction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So this is a good question as well. All these questions are great. So Jake asks, what would you have told Christina from six months ago? What advice oh. would you offer her now that your book is out? That's a good question. Oh. That is, especially as like a debut author, um, it's always like a roller coaster. Like what I was expecting... I, if if you went back to me six months ago and you were like, this is what's going to happen on your debut day and your debut week, I, I would not have believed myself just because there's, what is the world right now even? Like, it's just why, like, just me trying to process the events of last week. Um, but I, I think that as a debut author, I think it's so, uh, I, I think I would have just told myself to kind of, like, just it, it just be excited about your book I think I think I always second guess myself as someone who used to be a shy fearful child and, and occasionally shy and fearful adult um that I, that I just always convince myself like oh my god so many things are gonna go wrong I set myself up to like so many like weird and strange expectations but um now that my book is out and like I just the like support I've received like it, it just was amazing and and I just yeah I, I would have told myself six months ago to calm down, I guess. Like, I don't really know. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what my, my thought is, it, it feels, I feel like, and I don't know if you felt this way, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like, you know, with everything going on right now, it, it feels like almost, you don't, almost don't want to celebrate. You almost don't want to be loud about, oh, this is what's happening. And, 
and y you're like, it, it doesn't even matter. Does my book even matter right now? And in my yeah. project, like, it matters more than ever because it brings me so much joy and just feeds my soul when I when I see good, joyful things happening on my feed, on my Twitter, people celebrating the things that they've done. Um, exactly. And yeah. I mean, so I'm like, yes, more of that. We, we should not put any joy on hold just because Absolutely. joy is an act of resistance, right? So I mean, yeah. And also like my book is also an act of resistance to like white supremacy. Like this is a book yeah. by an author of color too. And so I was just like, I like, I, I did, I mean, I've had kind of the emotional like turmoil and everything, but I think at the end of the day, I was like, I, I'm gonna, I'm still gonna promote my book because this is a book that I'm really proud of. And something that I'm doing myself to kind of disrupt the narratives that are going on in the world right now. So of course I'm going to like, of course I'm going to try to like, you know, be excited about my book, even though I, the world is kind of just, uh, yeah, not, not doing great right now. So I totally agree with you. Yes. And you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying, well, I feel guilty when I write because it feels so unimportant right now. And I just think, Oh my God, it's the most important thing. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you turn off the news for a day and write and feed your creative well, guess what? The world keeps yes. turning. The news will still keep happening, but you will be in a better place. So right. that's how that's kind of how I feel about that. OK, so here's a question. Which Evermore song gives clues to the universe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Just, it's, it's this like cycle, like psychological conditioning at this point where someone mentions Evermore and I'm on the floor. Like, <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Uh, I, I think Marjorie, Marjorie has to capture her clues to the universe because it's about just the way that she writes about missing her grandmother um, is something like the, what is it? The like receipts, the like small moments that she spent with her grandmother in the car, the one that was like, I wish I had asked you all the questions. I wish I'd asked you how to be. It just resonates with clues so much because it's just, about like missing people and loving people and kind of holding on to like the memory of them. And so, yeah, before I start like crying, I solidify my answer to Marjorie. You're in a safe space. You can cry. Yeah. Um, I understand if you don't want to on your screen. Um, I love that because I mean, who hasn't lost someone who hasn't gone through loss um, in some way and, and is grieving in some way, right? Kind of like what we talked about before. It's universal. It's universal. So here's a good one too. Um, oh, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. How many manuscripts did you write before this one? Ooh. Yeah. You, oh, you wrote, well, it's hard to say, right? Because you've been writing since you were a kid, but when, when yeah. you decide, when you got like serious. Yeah. How I wrote, you? cause I was in national novel writing month. Um, so I did, I did have completed manuscripts. Like some of them were like, bad completed manuscripts, but they were complete. And so I think all in all I wrote, I think I wrote a total of probably, I think Clues is my fifth manuscript. Um, but yeah, it took a lot of trial and error to figure out how to write a book and how to write a book well before I, I ended up with Clues. Did you write Clues during NaNoWriMo too, or no? I wrote Clues during the summer, so during Camp NaNoWriMo. Um, and so, I, I mean, at that point, I was I was coming from kind of like a writing slump. I was a little bit like confused about where I wanted to go, and I, I honestly, I'm I, I wasn't sure if I was able to write a book again. I know that sounds so dramatic, but like sometimes you have those slumps where you're like, I don't know if my writing matters. Um, and so I set a goal of ten thousand words. I was like, I'm gonna write this as a practice novel to prove to myself that I can write middle grade. Um, and so I hit that ten thousand mark, and then I was like, okay, like I think I would like to continue with this book and so um I continued and then I I wrote it I the next time I wrote it I, it was, I didn't finish it during the NRI but those are definitely the events that like really like kicked me off with writing that's great and you know what whenever you say you know this 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 question of you know I don't even know if my writing matters and that kind of thing yeah I think like I always tell when I do school visits and talk to young people I always say um anything anything you create and put into the universe yeah um, matters right anything right. that you i don't care if you invent a silly song that makes no sense in your room and sing it at the top of your lungs right if you, if you write a page of a story and throw it in the trash and no one ever sees it right anytime you create something right and put it out mm -hmm. there you have made something that did not exist before because of you 
And that's right. why exactly. it's so important, right? That we, yeah. we do things that bring us joy and we create and we continue to put things into the universe. Yeah, exactly. And it always yeah. comes around. I think what I, you know, everything I trash, it always comes around in some format and, you know, manifests in, in my future writing. I believe that. I believe that the things that we put out, we get back, right? Yeah. Um, and let's see, before I lose my train of thought here. Um, and I've also had those moments too, where I had this just the other day, I was like, I think I'm out of ideas. Uh, I'm never going to write another book again. And then you have an idea, you know, the very next day, of course. Yeah. Um, so that kind of leads us to, we're, we're coming up on our time. So that kind of leads us to a good closing question, which is, what is next? Oh, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm currently working on a like second middle grade book, one that's like contemporary. Um, it's set in San Francisco and it's about a girl who it's I, I pitch it as the farewell meets the Joy Luck Club. Um, and so it's about a girl who feels super estranged from her family and her friends in her seventh grade year who gets uh, closer to her grandmother who has dementia. And so um, I'm currently working on that. Um, and I'm also because I, I'm like a kid writer. So like I write some middle grade, some okay. YA, also, also working on working some on um, YA projects YA right now. Right now. Awesome. awesome. And you know what that you makes me that think makes me is, um, um, oh, hi, you're back. Oh, I was, I was oh, hearing the echo again. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, okay. so, so um, you um, know what that made me think of is, you know, there's one thing that I saw that I read about you, Christina, was that one of your memories was, and I don't want to make you cry, so I don't, but <laughs> you were a little girl reading Little Health in the Prairie with your mother. Oh yeah. yeah. She was learning how to speak English and you were learning how to read. Yeah. And whenever we have conversations like this and I, I hear you say that you're, you're coming out with something and you're working on this other thing. And it makes me think of, you know, again, the little Christina's who, who need more books with characters who look yeah. like them that they mm -hmm. can cuddle up with at night and read with their parent. Right. And instead of, Little House on the Prairie characters. It's characters with not no shade to Little House on the Prairie, but it's characters who look like yeah. them and eat the food that they do and speak yeah. the way that they do and have, yeah. you know, and that's so important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I loved including, so I when I was reading books, right, again, not to say Little House on the Prairie, but I, I didn't even realize that I was capable of being a protagonist in a book. I know that sounds so weird and like strange now, but like, I genuinely did not see myself. So I didn't believe that I was capable of being a main character, right? Like people who looked like me were capable of being main characters. And then I read, you know, Grace Wins Red Mountain Meets Moon. I read, I like, I just like all like these books by Asian American authors. And I was like, oh, like I'm capable of not only starring, but writing those books as well. So yeah, I mean, I hope future like little Christina's hopefully read my book and they're like, I'm fully capable of writing a book. Like, watch me go, you know? So hopefully, yeah, that's what I would like to put forward into the world. I totally agree because when I was a kid, all my stories had white characters and they always had round blue eyes. Now, what does that tell me? Yeah. And this is like the eighties where, I mean, it still, it still happens today, of course, but mm -hmm. everything was blonde hair, blue eyes, blonde hair, blue yep. eyes. That's what's beautiful. That's what's American, yep. thin, blonde and blue. And yeah. so all my characters, all the popular girls, any any girls that had any happiness, <laughs> they right. always had to have blue eyes, you know? Right, exactly. And, and that's, well, yeah, that's not how it is. I, I, I had the same face. On my very first novel I was writing, I literally spent two paragraphs just, like describing just how beautifully violet her eyes were because I was like, she has to have these like beautiful violet eyes and has to have this like perfect, you know, curly brown hair. And I was like, like, that's not, oh, first of all, that's not a table. We still don't have violet eyes. But also it's, it's just, I think I was, I was putting into the world what I was seeing and what I was receiving. And so, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you in that it just, I, I would love for people to kind of fall in love with characters that kind of look like them and, and to kind of believe that they can, they are capable of like starring in these novels and, and you know, being great main characters. And yeah. yeah. Because I mean, why, you know, think about why is it when we think of 
what are what a beautiful eyes look like i mean how many green eyes are in ya fiction oh, i mean everyone yes. has green eyes all the time and exactly. exactly why not, why doesn't anyone ever have brown eyes you know exactly. and, yeah and i would so love to like that. that exactly and sorry i i, I didn't mean to cut you off okay, go, go, go. i i just want to plug there's this picture book that came out i think that just hit the new york times like like today it's called eyes that kiss in the corners um by joanna ho <laughs> It's so be just like the like lines in the book made me cry, and she was discover like describing kind of like Asian children, and she was like, you know, other people's eyes look like this, but my eyes kiss in the corners. Like how beautiful is that? You know, I just that that was I yeah. Sorry, our conversation made us think of that book because I, that was the book I would have loved as a kid. Oh, it's so beautiful, and I'm so thrilled for her because it's been it's, I've seen it everywhere, and it's amazing. Yeah. So. The next thing I have coming out is this is maybe, maybe Marisol Rainey. It comes out in May. It has, look, I illustrated it. I can't believe, I still can't believe I illustrated this. The talent you have. <laughs> Let me illustrate a book. But, um, and so Marisol is a half Filipino, half white girl growing up in Louisiana. So it's a lot of me. And it's about this tree that's in her backyard. And you see, you'll appreciate this, Christina, since you said that you were you were quiet and fearful, mm -hmm. as was I. I was yes. afraid to do anything, including climb a tree. I still have not climbed a tree in my life because, uh, well, now I'm just clumsy. So, But when yeah. I was a kid, I was convinced I would fall. I was too scared. I was mm -hmm. scared of everything. So that's that's also Mirasol. She's, she's scared it's of everything. So beautiful. Oh, my goodness. The cover is gorgeous. Thank you. I am so excited about this. So... Uh, it has been such a joy talking to you. I feel like we could just talk for another hour. I Yeah, I, was, I feel like I could talk to you forever. I mean, I love getting to talk to you today. I looked up to your books for such a long time. And so it's, it's just the people, like everyone's dream of getting to talk to their heroes. So yeah, absolutely. Everyone, please go check out Erin Trotter Kelly's books. They're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And now, welcome back. <laughs> Thank she you. She opened you for glasses. I was like, yes, and I, I took the echo away with the headphones. I, I have to remember to talk like this, though, so I feel like I'm trying to be some secret covert person that's way more important than I actually am. You can pretend to be that. It's fine. <laughs> you have to give us code names, though, if you do that. Oh, my goodness, wait. Um, Leia and Galaxy. Space Buns. Oh, that's perfect. What a, what a team to make. <laughs> and I'm horrible at naming <laughs> Well, I did put you on the spot. So. <laughs> I hate that this event has to end because it's been really enjoyable just getting to listen to the two of you speak. And I know, I agree, there's so much love in the comment section about how just like the characterization and all of you guys talking about just the characters and everything. If you want lots of love and you want to potentially cry, go back and read all the comments, Christina, because there's just lots of amazing love for you. And I am so happy that we got to celebrate you and your debut book. And thank yeah. you so very, very much to Aaron too. You are a phenomenal moderator tonight. So thank you both to both of you authors for giving representation and beautiful stories just to a community that very much needs it and for sharing them with us. And on that note, we will say thank you so much and we will see you on the next one. Yes, Bye, and thank you for hosting and thank you thank everyone. You. For yes. Yes. <laughs> Bye, guys. Good night. Bye. Thank you.